Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. Hi. Hey guys. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey guys, so what are you wearing? Uh shorts. <laughs> uh Cat, what are you wearing? <laughs> well, I'm wearing an a army green, you know, one of my I'm a Gina Willie t-shirts and I've got this. I love my little uh, Eddie Bauer shorts. They're like my little summer shorts and Sarah is always complimenting them. And mm-hmm, they're so cool. One pair that I got, um, I just got every color that they had, which is only like four colors. And one of the colors is this hideous, like orange rust type color. And it's... um it just is a color that doesn't work with my skin. I disagree. And well, thank you. And when we got on here this morning, I noticed I was like, Sarah's wearing a, a very. Wait, the orange hideous color. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. No, <laughs> hang on. Hey, those were your words, not mine. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm going to finish my sentence. Damn it. Even damn though it. it's taken me a long time to tell this story. Um, I just noticed that Sarah was wearing kind of like a muted, almost like vintagey version of the color I'm wearing, which mm-hmm. I really like. And so then it made me kind of like my shorts. Mm. Oh, see? And so we were just talking about how Sarah and I are dressed kind of kind of twinsies. Yeah. And so she has rusty orange shorts and I have kind of like, uh, what are these? Uh, they're like tealish blue, more blue, but whatever. I, I feel like our listeners are really en- encapsulated and invigorated mm. by okay. uh, this talk. I, I would like to say you both look like you could be park rangers based on the colors you're wearing. That's wow. what, and I think that's great. Look at my- well, thank you, Moose. Um, <laughs> since you've got much more interesting things to say, why don't you uh, step up to the mic? <laughs> oh, I am not being an asshole, I swear. It's too early for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is too early for that. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have more interesting things to say, but I would like to share some things I learned this week. If you would join me in my escapade. Yes. Yes. Go paid what is this you ask oh, 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 oh what is that well i'll post it on our instagram for our listeners who cannot see this but for patrons who only pay one dollar per month you get it free okay so this is from lost in history picks and this is what is called a conversation pit Ooh. it was popular in homes from the 1950s to the 1970s. We're so young, we didn't get a chance to experience yeah, them. That looks mm. awesome. But, um, Kat, how would you describe that? Well, it made me think, it reminded me of when I've been to um, those uh, Asian restaurants where, is that politically correct to say that? Asian? Yes. I think so. Okay. Um, where where you like sit on the ground and eat the food and it's like you oh, kind of yeah. mm-hmm. almost like step down into this like place to sit um right. so that's the very first thing that came to my brain and then th- seeing that it was lined with all these flowers that look like they're from a funeral i was Ugh. worried that it was like some sort of shrine or something oh, yeah, that's it's just poor decor oh i could see that especially with all the gold yeah. Here's another version. This oh. is probably a little more 50s. Yeah. So it's basically like a tiered um, floor where it goes down instead of up. And um, yeah, it's it's a giant couches. Ooh, like Some that. of them are around fireplaces. Um, but the whole point. Yeah. This one would be what you're describing. Kat. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 Yeah, so kind of like it. Yeah, so it's basically I th- I was very enthralled by it. I don't know why these words are coming out of me. Invigorated. <laughs> I don't know. Something's <laughs> happening. But I like it because it intentionally means we have to face each other. This yes. first one, it's basically four giant couches facing each other. Mm-hmm. Um but anyway, they were phased out for a number of reasons, including residents falling into them. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, you imagine how many people trying to get out of that, climb those five and a half stairs, you know, after having many drinks and conversations. I know, exactly. You have a couple drinks. How are you getting out? You're just falling right back into that seat. 
Right. My favorite thing on these Instagram posts are the the um, the comments. So I would love for you guys to maybe pick a few of them and read what people said after this post. <laughs> well, I have to read the one that that is just like right in front of my face. This person said that it screams '70s swinger and cocaine parties. <laughs> <laughs> it's freaking awesome. The, the the comments and stuff like this are are really the best. Um, a, somebody else says, if we brought them back, they wouldn't look like this. They'd be gray and depressing, which made me think of Gosh. West Elm and Restoration Hardware's new trolls. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Basically my whole house. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a new thing. A conversation pit. Had never hmm. seen that before. Mm-hmm. Well, it kind of reminds me of the Cat and Moose podcast. It's oh. like we're kind of like a we're like a conversation pit. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> oh my gosh, what if that's our new tagline? Yeah, because a pit can be good and bad. Like you can get in, True. and yes. you're like, oh man, like there's this great back and forth, and you're learning things. There's some good vibe, but you know, you might not get back out. Right. Or you may stumble trying to get back out and fall back in. And then, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like it, it, it could go so many different ways. So we're a conversation pit uh, podcast. Oh. Um, OK, so you brought that to the podcast this week. I um, went on a trip this weekend with a bunch of my body work colleagues and friends and um, had a really, really lovely weekend. We went to um, this little town in North Georgia and and it was just lovely. And one of the things that I I learned many, many things. One of the things I learned about this weekend on this trip um, was this internet phenomenon called Jack the Whipper. Have you seen this guy? (laughs) The Whipper, not the Ripper? (laughs) Yes. I have not. No. Can you show him to us? Yes. Oh. Wait, he has a whip. Yes. Jack the Whipper. That and that's the winner right there. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna do this. We're not gonna do the full nine minutes, I promise. <laughs> Is this the fair life? No. Um, we are, though. You guys know you gotta sing along for parts of this, right? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. Yes, okay, all right. Let me see if I can do this two handed. Um, we're gonna try a couple of cracks. Front row, if I start whipping you, please let me know. Am I whipping you? How about now? Still not? Okay. Thank you, sir. I see a little silhouette of my stash. Scaramouche, Scaramouche. Yes, I drew this thing on now. Thunderbolt and lightning. Jaxi Whipper frightening me. Jaxi Whipper. Jaxi Whipper. Jaxi Whipper Figaro. I'm just a French boy. Nobody loves me. <laughs> Easy come, easy go. Will you see my show? You had the, the perfect opportunity to change the lyrics there. Thank you, thank you. Okay, who is this guy? Is is he like a Disney entertainer? <laughs> uh, no. So he is the son of a circus entertainer um, from the New England area. And he, his dad, um, as part of the circus, understands and, and knows how to use bull whips and like does all this entertaining stuff with bull whips. And so um, since he was a kid, this guy's been, you know, uh, bull whipping. whipping? Yeah, by, by whipping people. <laughs> well, and you can imagine when when my friend told me she was like, "I'm obsessed with this new thing on the internet, Jack the Whipper," and I was like, "Okay, what's oh it about?" And she's God. like, "Well, it's this guy, and he has whips." And I was like, "Whoa!" Whoa. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not into that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, I, that's like, uh, what's that show called? Like forty somethings of something. Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I. I could never watch Fifty Shades of Grey. Like, could Mm-mm. you guys watch it? No, no. Maybe. 
yeah, it just, it's just not my thing. Like it's not, and, and if it's your thing, you do you. Like, I think that that's, that's why we're bringing in Jack the Whipper. Right. It might be your thing. Right. It might be your thing. And anyway, this guy like goes around performing at, at different like Renaissance fairs and stuff like that. And, um, and he's got a French background. And so his name sometimes is Jacques de Vupua. Oh, Jacques, Jacques de Vupua. That feels nice to say. It's so interesting how it's like there is something for everybody. Yeah, there is something for everybody. I I don't really understand this thing where people get like on social media and just like doom scroll or like watch TikTok for like hours at a time or whatever. And and I was researching this guy this morning because I wanted to know a little bit more about him after my friend told me about him. And, And I realized I burned almost an entire hour watching him perform on TikTok. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, I've, I've, I've gotten sucked in by Jack the Whipper. Oh, well, it was a matter of time. Uh, we are a non-judgmental podcast. So I would say that there was something inside of you that was drawn <laughs> to Jacques de Whipper. Uh-huh. And it wasn't a waste of time. It was you enjoying yourself. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I think this guy is so talented. Like he would hold a piece of dry spaghetti, like on the top of his head and you know, spaghetti's like that long or whatever. He would hold the piece like up here and then let the other end get on the, t- I don't know why I can't talk today. <laughs> and, um, and anyway, he would go, and he would like, he would like break the piece of spaghetti without smacking his neck or head, not whip himself to death in the face. Wow, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. just the amount of talent that this guy has is ridiculous. God, I feel like you might need to get some bull whips. Oh, ooh. <laughs> it could be one of our merch items. <laughs> <laughs> the cat and moose bull whip. Oh man. <laughs> A moose whip. <laughs> we could call it the cat whip. That's yeah. dirty. Yeah, that sounds dirty. Hmm. Okay, hold on. I have to pull up. I asked for something from our listeners and we received it. I love our listeners. They're so great. I know. Let me pull this up. I have some commentary on last week's episode. Okay. Oh, please go ahead. Um First off, I felt like there were a lot of knocks on the state of Nevada. Oh, yeah, there were. <laughs> there were. And we totally... Kat, you did make some generalizations about Nevada. I did. I was I was an asshole last week is the bottom line. Like I, when I went back and listened, I haven't heard the whole podcast yet, but I, I was listening to myself talk and I was like, Kat, you are just an absolute asshole. Like what is going no, on? Wait, no. well, give us an example. Yeah. I, I just completely, like you said, like I stereotyped and I, oh, I prototyped please. and you I prototyped. shunned and shamed. And <laughs> oh, so funny. All right, Sarah, back to you. You weren't there last week, so you, you get the mic. I did appreciate that Nevada turned into Vegas, which was great. So you weren't generalizing the entire state of which I'm from and belong. Mm-hmm. All right. The other thing is I want to say... And I would have said, had I been on that episode with you guys, um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is also a movie. Mm -hmm. And we can watch that together. Oh, I knew I had heard of it before. How is it newer or or is it an old one? It's it's like 90s, maybe. Yeah, it's it's uh, and I think they did a remake of it like in 2012 or something like that. Like there's I think there's even a couple versions of it. And um, and I was thinking, I'm like, who in my life can I watch this with? And you guys were immediately who I thought oh, yeah. of. And I wanted to finish reading the book before I watched the movie because I just wanted to know that I could finish a novel. And I started reading this book in the summer of 2021 and I finished it <laughs> Like a few days ago. Great job. Um, are we are we going to watch it together, you guys? Yeah. I, I would be willing to watch the movie. Okay. I think it, if I'm correct, it's the one that came out in 2005. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. And it's got Martin Freeman, which is awesome. Sam Rockwell, awesome. Zoe Deschanel, amazing. Oh. Alan Rickman. Who else? John Malkovich. Okay. I'm down. Guys. Maybe we'll understand more about 42 because I, I really <laughs> thought that Kat had like bootlegged Google and here I am being like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to see what Google says. And Google's like, oh, 
42. 42. Yeah. And then that (laughs) brings me to my next point. I felt like I had a lot of feelings around the number 42 because it's always been a funny number to me. Really? I've always used it in um, funny contexts when you over like, there were 42 walruses that showed up today. Something like this. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, And I'm going to be 42 this year. I'm living. Oh, that's right. I'm living my 42nd year right now. Is that right? Yeah, but people could debate that. I know. Like, I feel like you should just say when you turn 42 that that is going to be your year. My 42nd year. Okay. Yeah. I'm rounding the corner on my 41st and in December I will be 42 and I've just really waited a long time to get to that number. So I'm curious what happens. Now, what if this is the year? What if at 42 the meaning of life, which of course mm. we don't know, but what if at 42 that's when we start coming into mm. all of the awakening that yeah. we talk about. I almost threw a glass across the room. Oh, Kat has something to say. Oh, please. No, I, I just, I, I, I resemble that remark. <laughs> like, like I feel like once I hit a couple of years into my forties is when this whole shit show of a roller coaster called midlife crisis. Okay. Like happened to me. And it's like, yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful and it's been absolutely terrible and it's been absolutely everything in between mm-hmm. and I've changed a lot of my views on philosophy and religion mm-hmm. and the meaning of life and what's important and relationships and it's like yeah man Sarah I'm so excited for you okay so there's something to it I'm curious what other 42 year olds folks that are 42 or have been 42 what, how that resonates Mm-hmm. I can kind of trace my trauma back to that age as well. <laughs> Not trauma. <laughs> my uh, my journey into there's got to be more to this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, okay, so back to reading novels. Okay. I would like to thank our friend Jen, who has an amazing company called Mixtus Media. If you are a author. You should check out all the things that Mixtus Media does. But I I love that she wrote in. She answered our word problem. The word problem was, tell us why we should read fiction. And then Mm -hmm. secondly, tell us what we should read. Okay. So here is Jen's email. (laughs) The subject is fiction, dissertation, and books. I mean, she is an excellent student. She really is. (laughs) I love her so much. (laughs) Star student. Okay. She said, okay, just listen to the last podcast and heard your call for a reason to read fiction. Don't worry. Your girl is here. My knee jerk reaction for why you should read fiction is that it's better than dealing with real life. (laughs) (laughs) Great. But here's a better reason. For years, I only read nonfiction, but about three years ago, I decided I needed to stop being in my head all the time Mm -hmm. and exercise an area of my brain that I had not used in a long time, my imagination. Mm. Reading fiction allows you to awaken your imagination, to explore worlds, to create visuals in your head and just be. It's different than watching a TV show or a movie. You have to imagine what the people look like, how the surroundings would make you feel, what it smells like. It's a world that you can escape to in your mind's eye. It's inspiring, comforting, and it's like a vacation for your brain. Mm. And it will make you deeply appreciate the creativity and imagination of the author Mm -hmm. that they can describe and bring worlds, people, places to life with their words is incredible. We all have been in awe of the creativity and talent of songwriters, and fiction will bring about the same admiration for the Mm. authors as well. It's so inspiring. I know you're probably going to be bombarded with tons of book recommendations. I feel like restraining myself because I have a mountain (laughs) of books I'd love to recommend, but here are two to ease you in. I'm so excited about this. She says the first one is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Mm. Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Okay. This book became one of my all-time favorites last year. It is incredibly well-written, and the end will knock your socks off. I'm excited about that. And then the other one, and of course it's by our local, our favorite, Mm -hmm. our our bookstore owner here in town, Ann Patchett, and it's her book called The Dutch House. (laughs) Incredible book (laughs) with complex family dynamics. Feels like home. (laughs) Hmm. Amazing storyline 
and the cover is one of my all-time favorites. It's stunning. And then she also said, Moose, since you love your police scanner, I could share a bunch of murder mystery thriller books that might scratch that itch. If you want, I can share more suggestions when you all are ready. You all are amazing. Big hugs, Jen. Mm. I mean, Jen, you are so, so cool. Good. Like, like ever since I first met you, like your coolness has just absolutely just bedazzled me. Like it makes me mm. so happy. And um, thank you for that. Like that's such a, it's so true. Like the person that introduced me to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I, I was able to talk with her this weekend. She was a part of the group I was with. And, um, and I was telling her how fascinated I was by one of the characters that has two heads and therefore has two brains oh. and the br his brains taught one another how to never let him figure out the answer to life, the universe and everything, because it, it like it, his brains basically were like working together to protect him from kind of knowing all things. It kind of reminded me of like, do not eat the apple of the tree of good and evil or knowledge of good and evil. You know, it's yeah. like very similar concept. And I love what that did to exercise my brain mm -hmm. to go, yeah. Oh, like how, how did that character do that? So hmm. very true, Jen. Thank you so much for the recommendation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to your point about the two headed being, um, and not allowing it to figure out what the meaning of life is. Like, don't you think that that mystery of not knowing keeps, like, the interest alive? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because we will always seek, but we will, I don't think we'll know until potentially mm -hmm. another life or whatever is mm -hmm. after this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, and yet that also, in some ways, can be, like, daunting, too, of, like, I'm going to keep seeking, but will I ever know? Mm -hmm. But for me, I think all of the seeking creates awareness that maybe you didn't have prior to. Mm. I love what she said about um, f fiction and just being like, it allows you to just move into your imagination. And, you know, we mm -hmm. talked about uh, what well, you guys talked about play a lot last week. And um, I think that is one of my favorite things about fiction books or um, podcasts, these kinds of things that are more storyline based, um, especially when I'm driving, which I love driving. Um, when I'm doing long distances, um, I love putting my headphones in or if everyone's willing to listen to have something like that, because it just keeps my mind awake and alert and, mm -hmm. you know, while mm -hmm. I'm driving, but also I'm enjoying being in that imaginative state, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, that to say, this could be a good one too. I know I'm sure there are some, a lot of purists out there and we should be actually reading the book, but I also enjoy listening to the books, Me um, too, especially yeah. when I'm driving. And anyway, we have that, a four week travel coming up here soon. And I am looking forward to, um, putting some of these books on that list. Oh, we're going to skip yeah. from podcast to books. I'm excited. We can bounce. We can jump and bounce. Sarah, what has, um, what has it been like to be on this tour that you've been out on? Oh man, it's been so fun. Um, it's been such a contrast for me, uh, in really obvious ways and some really not obvious ways. Um, this tour is of two speakers, um, two podcasters, and, um, they also speak at churches or, um, in corporate settings and whatever. And, um, it's just such a unique show, um, that the two of them have created very fun. Um, and I have been playing the role of tour assistant. So I'm just, uh, well, I wish what I've been sharing is the contrast of what I've been working with is typically in the music, on the music side. So there's usually a band or two that I'm managing. And, um, I was out on a tour earlier this year that there were 12 people on a bus and two people managing 10, you know, kind of artist like folks. And on this tour, there are 12 people out on a bus and 10 people managing two artist like <laughs> folks. And so there's quite a contrast in the amount of help and, um, just, um, actual physical assistance out on the road. Everyone's got a role. Everyone is following their role. And so no one's wearing seven hats and, you know, trying to Man. pick up the pieces and make it all flow. Like once we fell into the groove after a couple of days of, of doing the show, it's been just actually a really chill and relaxing tour because we get our stuff mm. done and then everyone's got blocks of time where they can relax or go explore the city or do whatever. And so it's been really fun. And, um, I will say for me personally, 
I have not felt more myself in a work setting. Like, you know how we often mm. talk about um, uh, putting, like sending, uh, I think Glennon Doyle calls it uh, sending our representative out, or we put this other, we kind of send this other version of ourselves out, the professional, the work version or whatever. And I think we are so used to living in dual or maybe multiple roles that um, that's been at least what's been true for me in my work setting. And this time I was, I went in with the intention of be yourself and be who you are and let people see your f funny witty side or, you know, the side that you guys get to hear from me on this podcast. I don't always present with that. Yeah. And anyway, I, I have, I've intentionally gone out and presented myself as me. Um, and it's just been so well received and liked and, um, it makes it easier just to be myself. I don't have to pretend to be anyone else. That's so great, Sarah. I love what you said too about how um, it's a contrast to some of the work like this that you've done before because you're not wearing seven different hats yeah. or really you're not wearing 42 different hats, right? right? Yeah. And so um, it, to me, like that feels really like congruent with this whole idea of effortless action, like mm -hmm. Wu Wei, the mm -hmm. stuff that I'm always preaching about. And it's like, I don't know why we feel like we have to be doing 42 different things I know. when where we are at our very best potentially is when we are being our most authentic self and doing the thing or the things that bring us and everybody around us life and mm -hmm. peace and healing and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I, I don't know why it's so hard to find that groove. And, and I think part of being in midlife is, is figuring that piece out yeah. is going, yeah. wait a minute. I've been efforting, 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 go, 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 go. And while that has served me well in some areas, there are other areas where it's really been a detriment to me, yeah. you know? So I'm so happy, Sarah, yeah. that you're getting to do that. Thank you. Yeah. And I will say, when you say, I don't know why it's so hard for me, it, why it's so hard is I think it's hard. It's vulnerable. It's hard to be mm. yourself because if you're mm -hmm. yourself, I mean, all we've got is ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We can put on these other presentations or these other versions of ourselves, which are still us, but maybe a little less real, you know, but if we present authentically and we, we put our real selves out there, that's freaking scary because that's all you've got left, right? If that's not accepted, <laughs> yeah, then, you know, you really put a lot on the line, but then it's like, what if like, I'm, I mean, I'm a six, I live in what ifs, what if, what if, what if it's bad? What if it's bad? Well, what if it's good? What yeah. if you are accepted? Right. And, and so <laughs> right, it's like, right. maybe I try that. I'm only doing this tour. There's 12 dates. It's just the month of June. What if I try it for mm -hmm. a month, you know? And it's like, I'm amazed at how it's mm -hmm. turned out and how I feel. And like, I'm not overwhelmed because I'm not overworking myself right, right. professionally, but also emotionally. And like, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Just, I'm just mm -hmm. being myself. And so that's been really awesome. And I've been pretty amazed to see what's, what's transpired from it. You know, there's, mm. it, it turns into, I want to continue working with you here, you know, other job opportunities may be coming my way and these kinds of things. And it's like, mm. Oh my God, like here I'm striving, I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to find it. And it's like, you let go of all the work and, and, and it just, be yourself. It's going to come like the universe yeah. comes and rewards that, you know? Yeah. And I'm like experiencing it. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's so great. I, I, I have been, I was so glad you shared that last part, Sarah, cause I wanted to, but I was like, that's not mine to share. But, yeah, um, yeah. uh, I said to Sarah, a couple things have come her way as far as, um, side gigs and people going, I want to work with you again and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, that's because, you walked into something. I mean, she didn't know a person really out. She knew uh, she had an acquaintance on this tour, but like she didn't really know anyone. That's pretty damn vulnerable to go get on a bus mm -hmm. for five mm -hmm. days, the first run yeah. and be like, Oh, mm -hmm. Hey, 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 you know, well for me it would be. <laughs> yeah. oh, and I'm like, and sorry to interrupt, but I like, you were dropping me off for my first bus call that. And I literally was like, had tears in my eyes on my way going, what if I'm alone? Like, mm -hmm. what if nobody knows me? You know, and, and it's like, those are, I felt like I was going to first day of kindergarten, you know, <laughs> it's like, so it really did feel that way. But it reminds me of what this coach mentor, and I know I talked about this uh, several episodes back. Um, I remember telling you guys that she said, I never say no. Like that was her, that was sort of her yeah, mantra right. of, you know, as far as clients go. Mm. And her thing was, well, if the universe brings it to me, then it's probably mine to have. Hmm. And it's such an interesting thing to what you just said, Kat. Um, 
response to that, I mean, is that, um, you know, we were out there striving, 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 and mm-hmm. we have these earning years that we always talk about, like, oh, we got to get out there and prove ourselves, and, you know, get all this experience so that we can be in the next level. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens in midlife is we start recognizing that that is exhausting, number one, and we can only mm-hmm. do it so long. And yeah. secondly, if we open our hands and just receive instead of strive, And we bring our most authentic self. Like, that's what I said to Sarah. I was like, Mm -hmm. the reason all this stuff is falling into your lap like never before is because you said, this is who I am. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to outsource my self-worth. Like, I'm just here with my hands open going, whatever comes my way, as long as Mm -hmm. this is what you see and this is what you know you're going to get, I'm in. Mm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Um, one of the the other conversations I found myself in this weekend was um, the person I was talking to said, what if everything that you did and that you are is just okay? Yeah. Because I was telling a story and, and I said, God, I said, this story is getting so long. And she was like, what if that's just okay? Yeah. Mm. And I was just like, Bleh. You know, and it's like, gosh, like it's so beautiful. And like Mm -hmm. one of the signs in this little Airbnb um, that we rented for the weekend, one of the little sayings on on this little sign says, be yourself. I like you that way the most. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, (laughs) to Sarah's point of we're all we've got. If we truly are uniquely and beautifully created, which we all believe that we are because we're listening to this podcast Mm. and we believe there is a God inside of us or whatever you want to call it inside of us, a spark, a consciousness, whatever. We're here for a reason. Why would we represent anything else but that original piece of art? (laughs) Right. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's beautiful, Moose. You guys, we should be philosophers. We are philosophers. We are (laughs) a conversation pit that you cannot crawl out of because you've had too many (laughs) mojitos and the conversation is just too damn good. That's right. That's right. And, and, and I'm thinking about how there was a lot of vulnerability shared, um, amongst friends and colleagues this weekend. And one of the things that we were talking about, and and it's kind of like your conversation pit that you brought up Moose. And I wanted to ask you guys about this. Um, cause I know you guys love what I'm about to talk about is the beauty of sitting around a campfire. Mm. Oh, we did it last night. I love it. Why do you love it? Oh, why do you love it? It, Okay, the campfire, I think, is like generationally a metaphor for community. Hmm. Mm, Hmm. mm -hmm. That's good. Like not even generationally. What's the word? Um, Our ancestrally, maybe. Historically? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Guys, I'm not great with words, but I get there sometimes. Like our ancestors used. Mm. Oh, we've we've always done it. Yeah. Yeah, and the fire represents security, warmth, warmth, comfort, safety, yep. food, and that everything's going okay. So mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is sort of the foundation for me. Mm-hmm. What about y'all? Well, in 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 somebody said this weekend that um, it's it's often a little bit easier to be vulnerable around a fire because you don't have to stare into the people's eyes mm. around you the mm-hmm. whole time. You can. Mm-hmm. You can also just as you're sharing or as you're processing or as you're feeling through whatever is going on, you can just look into the flames and and just become mesmerized and 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 almost like held. Mm. Yeah. And I thought that was really beautiful. It's like, wow, I'm I'm saying a thing that's really vulnerable and really hard, but I've got the comfort of this thing that I I trust and am watching move and shape in in divine ways that that have never been before and will never be again. And it's like, how comforting is that? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Like you're all connected by the fire because mm-hmm. you chose to sit around it. You know? Yeah. Like it's the center. Yeah. I mean that, the smell of it. I mean, I literally have, I have a whole container of these little, uh, they're bricks that are pinion pine, basically like super condensed, 
um, sawdust that they make it into like tiny little bricks and then you light it on fire and it smells like a campfire. And it's my favorite smell mm. in the world. And I have it going right now. I have it going on in the house. In fact, yeah. I even have our gas fireplace going downstairs in the middle of summer and our house <laughs> AC is on because sometimes <laughs> it's just comforting to have the fire going. It is. You got to yeah. crank it down and turn on the fire. I also think that, speaking of vulnerability, the fire kind of represents something vulnerable. Like, oh, yeah. here's something that could mm. could overtake you, mm. right. but yeah. in a safe form, it's kind of like emotion, right? Mm -hmm. In a safe form, mm -hmm. it could be healthy, and it could be, mm -hmm. you know, a conduit for conversation. Right. It's controlled, mm -hmm. you know? That's the word, controlled. Mm. Mm. Nice. I, it reminds me too, like, obviously if you have a fireplace in your house, you use that in the winter, you know, in the cold months, whatever. Um, but we, I'm a camper. I love camping a lot. We go a lot. And, you know, that's something that we kind of start and end our days with, mm -hmm. you know, mm. and mm -hmm. it, you think about the back in the old days when that was the main source of heat, like it, it kind of reminds me of two, like, you're out doing your work and your stuff throughout the day and it brings the family back together at the end of the night or the mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. back together at the end of the night because we're all circled around, you know, before we go off to bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least that's what happens when my family goes camping and, you know, we all do our things throughout the day and then we end the night around the fire together. It's a touch point for family. It's a family touch point. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I know that we've been talking about the nun who didn't decay except for her hands, but did you guys hear about the lady <laughs> who was in the coffin and tapped on it during the funeral? No, no. She wasn't, she wasn't dead. No, no. That's this has so happened no. before in like, in like the, um, the, not the morgues. What are they called? The, where they're like in the fridge mortuaries. Yes. Oh my gosh. There's a video. This is the moment a woman who woke up in her own coffin at a funeral parlour was taken to hospital. Bella Montoya, a 76-year-old, was declared dead at a hospital in Ecuador and a death certificate was issued, according to her son Gilbert. She was put in a coffin and taken to a funeral parlour where her relatives held a vigil before planning to bury her. But when they opened the coffin to change her clothes ahead of the funeral, Bella gasped for air. Gilbert says his mum then started to move her left hand and open her eyes and her mouth. Bella was then taken back to the hospital where she'd been previously declared dead, where she's said to be an intensive care but responsive ecuador's ministry of health has set up a committee to investigate the incident that is that's that's terrifying terrifying at least she wasn't buried that would be even worse wow how does that happen though um so then they took her back to the same hospital that declared her dead. That seems a little stupid. Yeah, that kind of seems. <laughs> I, I love that comment that says no one will believe her next time she dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, sadly, she did die a week later, but um, she oh, was in God. ICU in a coma. And uh, sure enough, she uh, got declared dead. And yeah. So, I mean, if oh you're gosh. having a bad day, it's not that bad. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> You probably got a week left, so hang in there, guys. <laughs> Special thanks to our producer, Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Production.